So I invite you to uh, imagine uh, a pre-human ancestor, furry, lemur-like creature living furtively in the primordial forest. And so he's walking through the forest, and he sees something attractive. Well, maybe, it's, maybe it's some food or a potential sexual partner. And there's this wired-in instinct that draws all his attention right down to that object, whatever it is, and prepares his body to move towards it. And then he notices something that's uncomfortable. Maybe it's a large predator. And the same instinct draws all his attention right down to that beast, blocks at everything else, and prepares his body to get out of there. So uh, this instinct gives him an obvious evolutionary advantage. Uh, to be effective, it has to be very fast. And to be fast, it has to be simple. And to be simple, it doesn't figure out what to do about the food or the mate or the predator. It just says, this is good, figure it out. This is bad, figure it out. And you'll notice that the instinct directs all its attention out there into the world to whatever is going on there, rather than inside to how he feels about it. If you think about it uh, just a little bit, it makes a lot of sense. If he just got really caught up, oh, that lady, she, uh, I just, I feel so lovely inside. I just, I feel light and joyful. I just, oh, I'm, it's so wonderful. If he gets all caught up in how he feels, she's likely to move on before his DNA gets a chance to reproduce. Right? And if he gets all caught up in, oh, that, that, that ugly beast, I was having such a good day, and now I just feel my stomach's all tight knots, and I don't like to have sweaty palms. If it gets all tied up in how it feels to be so frightened, he and his DNA are much more likely to get eaten. Uh, so this instinct is the opposite of introspection. Puts all our attention out there rather than in here. We humans have such an instinct. I don't have scientific data as to its evolutionary origins, but it certainly behaves as if these speculations are true. It is fast, it is simple, it is precognitive, it is preverbal, and it focuses all our attention. It just narrows our attention down to one object out there, whatever that is. We have lots and lots of names for this instinct. Desire, attraction, attachment, fixation, disliking, revulsion, disgust, fear, anger, uptightness. It's the feeling that gives rise to the thought, I like it. I don't like that. I want more. Get me out of here. But the instinct itself is preverbal. I can't say this enough. It is preverbal. It is precognitive and arises so quickly inside us that we don't have any control of it. It just comes in uninvited. So perhaps a better term for it is getting hooked. Or even the devil made me do it. In, um, in Tibet, the word for it is shenpa or shenpa. If any of you have, uh, are familiar with any of the writings of Pema Chodron, uh, then you, you may have come across this term. But in the earliest Buddhist text, it is called tanha, T-A-N-H-A, -A, tanha. Tanha is the uh, so-called second of uh, four ennobling truths of the Buddha, which says that our experience of difficulty, not necessarily the, the, the stimulus for it, but the, the roots of our experience of difficulty inside is this instinctual tightening. And the third ennobling truth says that we can release it and relax regardless of our, uh, regardless of our circumstances. I'm a bit of a Buddhist geek, so I could go into all kinds of technical detail. Um, but what I would like to do um, this afternoon is, is come at this in a little broader, more practical, uh, from a more practical frame of reference. 
uh, I want to reflect with you around this question, how can we thrive during difficult times? It's not how do we survive, how do we manage, how do we get by, how do we stumble through. No, it's how do we, is, are there ways that we can actually thrive during difficult times? Are there ways in which um, we can navigate rough waters uh, and still have our lives feel deep and enriched and our hearts feel open? And I think the key to answering that question is actually tanha, this instinctual tightening. But since it focuses all our attention out there in the world, it is uh, surprisingly elusive surprisingly difficult to see in our everyday experience. So I want to start uh, today by um, spending some time talking about just how to recognize it in our daily experience. And then we'll take a little time in looking at what some of the things that trigger it and to bring it forth in us. And then that'll set the stage for us to look at this, uh, the more crucial question. How do we release it and relax so that we can feel enriched, even in difficult times. And as David mentioned, um, I talk about this at, at more length in my book, Buddha's Map, so if you're interested in it, you can pick that up. How's that for uh, very slyly sneaking in a commercial? <laughs> so uh, start with how to recognize it. I was trying to, to uh, think of a good analogy for what it's like to, to recognize this instinctual tightening. Uh, and what came to me uh, was my boys, when they were little, searching for Easter eggs. So on uh, Easter Sunday morning, they would run out in the yard looking for the Easter eggs. You know, they were, they were hidden out there, and they would look inside little boxes and behind trees and in holes, and, uh, and they just um, they couldn't find any. Uh, because the Easter Bunny, my wife and I, uh, always hid the Easter eggs in plain sight. You know? We'd take a yellow one and put it in a batch of yellow flowers and a green one on a tuft of green grass and a bright red one on the little fire truck in the sandbox. So they were placed, uh, so they were easy to see, but in such a way that they blended in with the yard. So in their excitement, my boys would overlook the obvious. And then after a few minutes, they've got it. And they would stop, relax, and look around, and they would see them everywhere. So this instinctual tightening is like that. It is in plain sight, but since it diverts our attention out there rather than in here, we overlook the obvious. But if we just stop and look carefully, we began to see it everywhere. I was talking earlier before you, some of you came in, you had to, had the experience. Well, I did this uh, actually this morning driving in from Sacramento. I was uh, going down, the traffic was moving fine. It was thick, but it was moving. And some guy came in on the on-ramp. And I don't know what you learned, but I learned that they're supposed to yield. At least that's my little righteous attitude inside. Well, he would just squeeze himself in, and without even thinking about it, I could feel my hands tightening on the steering wheel. That's Tanha. Or maybe you're in a gentle, free-flowing conversation, you know, with a colleague or a friend, and then her eyes cloud over and she looks away, and you say, uh, did I say something wrong? And she says, no, everything's fine. I have to go. So you just witnessed that instinctual tightening, completely unnamed, but you saw it there. Um, now other examples. You're talking on your cell phone as you're walking down the sidewalk, and you go across the street, you're carrying on the conversation, but your eyes just look up and down the street for a moment. You don't even think about it. That instinctual tightening is just directing you to look for traffic danger. Here's another place where you can always recognize tanha. Complaining. Anytime there's complaining, 
when you find yourself complaining about something, just go ahead and, you know, and, and finish it out because um, you may enjoy it on some level. But just sort of watch and you'll see you feel a place that's tightened up in, in you a little bit. I was, um, I was on my way home and uh, stopping in the grocery store. We needed some, um, every morning I have a protein smoothie with milk and bananas, and we were out of all that, so I needed some milk and bananas and a few other things, just about five or six things. So I went in the grocery store, put them in the basket, and as I was heading for the checkout line, uh, there must have been five or six um, checkout counters that were working, and all of them were backed up three or four carts, except for one that was empty. So I navigated towards it, and as I did, I noticed a woman coming from the other side with this overflowing basket, and she was headed for it too. So my pace, I didn't even think about it, just picked up a little bit. Oh, did I cut you off? I'm so, oh, no, that's okay. So that's a, that's a little bit of Tanakh. Um, oh. I was considering going to bed early one night when my wife said uh, that she wanted to uh, check her emails on the computer in the bedroom. And so I said to her, okay, I'll just, I wanna, I'll just stretch out in the other room for a few moments. And she said, oh no, I don't want to drive you out. I'll check it out in the morning. Sounds like a very civil adult conversation. But if you had actually witnessed it, you would have noticed that my voice was just a little pouty. Oh, I'll go sit in the other room. And her voice was a little irritated. Both of us had contracted a little bit into that Tanakh. Um, I picked up uh, a ream of paper off the shelf in the office supply store. And rather than go to the checkout line, I just started wandering down the aisles a little bit to see if there was something else. You know, like I, ah, pens. No, I've got enough pens. Maybe. Oh, labels. And then suddenly I realized what I was doing. There was this little place that had contracted just a little that was looking for something that would feel good to buy. You ever done that? So I, did, I recognized a little, that little bit of tightening inside me. And, and when I did, I couldn't help but smile and kind of laugh at myself internally and just head for the checkout line. The Dalai Lama was at a conference in Los Angeles, this is a number of years ago. And he was staying in a hotel that was 10 blocks from the conference center. So every morning and every evening, somebody drove him you know, back and forth from his hotel to the conference room. And in that 10 block stretch, there were about five blocks that were filled with electronic stores. I don't know if you know anything about the Dalai Lama, particularly his early years, but he's always been fascinated with Western technology. So in his opening remarks uh, one morning at this conference center, he said, looking out the car window this morning, I wanted things without even knowing what they were. <laughs> so if you worry about having Tanah, just know you're in good company. The Dalai Lama has it too. So this tightening, it feels like a, like a tug or an urge or a drive. It kind of pushes us a little bit. Uh, and it's uncomfortable. It gets our uh, attention by creating attention and then pushing us to do something about it. And if there's nothing we can do to resolve it, then we're left with a kind of an unnamed edginess just begging for resolution. You know that place? Talking here, you know, before we started, I'm, you know, a lot of that, you feel that, you're not quite sure what it is, it's just a kind of accumulated edginess. While this instinct was uh, obviously very helpful in primal situations, and is still helpful today in, in simple situations, and the uh, complexities and nuances of modern life, sometimes it really is not terribly helpful. Because what it does is it gets us to focus in on one detail. 
when the resolution to a lot of the issues we're dealing with are really complex where you really have to see the whole forest. You have to have this broad vision to see that. I'm just assuming all you know what I talk about is seeing people. It's hard to see it on yourself, but you see other people dealing with a situation and they just latch on to some little detail. Um, and it's never going to be solved that way. All right, if you want some real live examples of all of this, just watch the political campaigns. <laughs> I don't recommend it. But, you know, they're always sort of latching on some detail and point to it for blame. So um, this, this tana, this instinctual tightening, to a greater or lesser degree, I think colors almost uh, all of human experience to some degree or another. And when you get too much of it, if you, if you have absolutely none, then life gets kind of dull. But when you get too much, there's, there's just an edginess that you don't know quite what to do. So let me shift gears here, turn from what it feels like to uh, look at some of the things that trigger it in us. Some of the triggers are really obvious, um, just large things. Uh, job stress, relationship difficulties, economic hardship, uh, medical problems, children's or children's difficulties, economic insecurity, war, political amenity. Do any of you ever watch the campaign and think, oh, this is so lovely to watch? <laughs> so those are the obvious triggers. But there are very subtle ones that, that can uh, set it off in us as well. Loneliness, you know, soft annoyances, quiet worries, a sense of meaninglessness. You know, what, what, what am I, why am I doing this now? Purposelessness. It may be very quiet and hard to see, but it, it creates that little discomfort in there. Wanting, wanting something or wanting to be rid of something we have can create it as well. So let me just ask, what, what are some of the sources of stress or difficulty uh, in your life? I just want to see if we can create a list of a variety. What, what is it that hooks you or gets to you? You don't have to explain it, we just sort of call it. Or maybe it's not for you, maybe it's a loved one. You don't want to identify yourself. Yeah, relationships. So relationships. Interpersonal conflict. Interpersonal conflict. Taxes. Taxes. <laughs> Workload and work demand. Workload and work demand. Release dates. I, I remember I, uh, I worked as a high performance graphics programmer back in the 80s for a little while. And the first release I was on, you know, you know, at the last minute, it's like we're, last week and a half, it's like everybody's just working like banshees trying to get this thing out. And we finally got it out. We're all going to go out and have lunch together. And this note came around from our boss that said, great, good work, good product. You did wonderful. Go out, celebrate and be back in a half an hour because we're already behind on the next one. <laughs> so other types of things that, that trigger this. What gets to you? Selfishness. Selfishness. Yeah. When you become really lonely, you feel like you are out of fear or whatever. Right, right. Sometimes you can be inspired to do something and be afraid about not doing it at the same time. At least I can. Other things. Misunderstandings. Misunderstandings. They happen all the time. What else? Feeling rushed. Feeling rushed. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to just sort of take your time and somebody's pushing and you can be doing the same thing or doing one way is fun. When it's rushed, it just it becomes no fun. It's almost like you feel cheated. What's that? Yeah, it's that um, emotional isolation. Like emotional isolation. That's a huge one. Yeah, it's a huge one. Okay, you've got the idea. 
So um, the question is, the question is, what do we do about these? What do we do about them? Now remember, this tightening focuses all our attention out there. That's what the instinct is. Uh, and sometimes that makes sense. I mean, I assume that all of us here are, have some commitment to living life in the, you know, out in the world. Anybody here live in a convent or a monastery? You know? so, um, so we embrace the interdependent web. And so oftentimes to solve problems, we like to just deal with them on their own terms. So you get sick or you have an injury, have a concussion. Um, what do you do? Rather than just pray or meditate, you know, you go to a doctor or a healthcare professional or look at diet or rest or exercise or something to work with a body on its own terms. Or if, um, if your job is in trouble, what do you do? Well, talk to the boss or um, refresh your resume or uh, look towards uh, getting some more education, increasing your job skills, networking, you know, dealing with the job somehow on its, on its own terms. Or relationship difficulties. What's the first advice we usually give somebody? Like, have you talked to the person? You actually talk to them. And if it's difficult to talk to them, you know, maybe they talk to a counselor or a good friend or a support group or something that deals with relationships on its own terms. Or just a very simple thing. You want something, you have enough money, what do you do? You go out and buy it. So uh, if, if these strategies resolve the problem, you know, that's great. That's great. Cure the disease. Find a new job, uh, resolve our kids' obstreperousness, buy that piece of music, and that's great. But there are some times when we do everything we can, and the problem just lingers. Um, I moved to Sacramento in the summer of 2000. I was living on the East Coast, uh, and I was called to come out to serve a, a, a large church, a large progressive church. And at that time, our youngest son was just about to go into his senior year of high school in this charter school in Massachusetts that he had helped found and poured his heart into. So the first year, I came out alone, and he and my wife stayed uh, back in Massachusetts so he could finish up his high school year in this, this community that he knew. And um, mostly it was OK. You know, I missed him, uh, but I was busy getting to know a new community. There was a lot for me to do there, and I knew the separation was going to be temporary. But I have to tell you, uh, Friday evenings were hard. You know, Fridays have been family time. We used to play board games or go to a movie or just hang out together. And so, you know, Friday afternoon, as the twilight began to settle in, I could feel this sort of aching in the center of my chest. So I would call him and talk to him on the phone. It wasn't, it wasn't quite the same. Sometimes the pangs of loneliness felt just intolerable. Sometimes there is no cure for the disease. Sometimes there are no appropriate jobs for us. Sometimes, most of the time, we really don't have the power to solve the political scene. Sometimes, well, not sometimes, the loved one who died they're just not coming back. Sometimes our kids have difficulties that just don't have an easy solution. They just don't. These, these are the truly difficult times. 
sometimes the stress that we're feeling, we do everything that we know, and it's just not enough. What do we do then? What do we do then? There are three popular strategies for dealing with unsolvable problems. Grab something, push something away, space out. The Buddha talked about them. They are current with us. I think they've been all in between years. They will be around for hundreds of more years. Grab something, push away, or space out. So let's talk a little bit about each of those strategies. So the first strategy is to just grab for something. Or maybe we um, become kind of needy, feel a little needy. So this unresolved tightening oftentimes does feel like a hunger or a thirst or uh, an emptiness. And so we look for something to fill that vacuum, that space inside. Um, I remember it was the beginning of my senior year in college. I uh, broke up with a girlfriend, and um, and it was the right thing to do. I, you know, I knew it had had to be done, um, but I was really upset about it, and I and I just didn't know what to do with myself. So I went out and I bought a record album. Anybody remember those? It, uh, what I actually bought was uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Waters. <laughs> and it was soothing. You know. Many people get in the habits of uh, shopping you know, as a way of uh, trying to feel better. Or rather than to get stuff, some of us, I'm more inclined this other way, is to actually collect experiences that will distract us. There's a variation on this strategy that uh, I'm sure all of us have seen, which is rather than do stuff ourselves, we try to get other people to do things for us. Many people try to control others as a way of handling their own discomfort. None of you do that, I'm sure. But we've all seen people who become controlling. And sometimes these strategies are actually soothing, you know, and help us relax a little bit. But if they don't address the true hunger, they're not going to have any really lasting or sustaining value. So grabbing something, first strategy, that doesn't work. Sometimes what we do is we try to uh, do the opposite. Rather than grasping things, we push things away. We become irritable or angry. We've all seen this in others. We've always, we all felt it in ourselves. We snap at people more readily. We uh, become less tolerant of their foibles. We uh, lose our temper, criticize more readily. Things that used to roll off our back now kind of get under our skin. So expressing that irritation can help feel a little better, but again, if it doesn't deal with the real problem, it has no lasting, uh, it's not a lasting solution. You could be mad at people at work and come home and kick the dog until the dog dies, but unless you deal with whatever is treated, it just doesn't work. So um, the third strategy then is to space out. There's nothing I can do, so I'm just not going to think about it. Yeah. Always stay busy or medicate ourselves with alcohol or something else. Or just don't pay attention to how lousy we feel inside. I just, we just numb out. All of us have done this. And it can be helpful sometimes for a short, for a short term, for a temporary situation. But as a long-term strategy for a long-term difficulty, it is disastrous. It makes us all vulnerable to addictions. I, um, I've done a lot of things. Uh, I worked as a psychotherapist for um, about a dozen years. And the clients that came to me uh, were all using one of these strategies or sometimes a combination of them. 
So my job was to listen carefully and attentively to what was going on with them so that together we might find more effective ways that they could enrich their lives. And when I listened carefully to, uh, to their stories, it frankly didn't surprise me that they felt so messed up. What astounded me was that they weren't all locked up on the back ward of psychiatric hospital. If we listen deeply to what many of us have gone through as children or adults, it's amazing that we're as healthy as we are. I mean, truly, truly. The human spirit is incredibly resilient. It's amazing the depth of pain and suffering that we can experience and still come out the other side with hearts and minds that are open and supple and alive. Yeah, we may feel the pain of it, but it's amazing what we can go through uh, without being crippled. But there's one thing that brings us down faster than anything else. There's one thing that causes us to crash and burn more quickly than anything else. Isolation. Isolation. When we're not alone, our natural wisdom and compassion and empathy can flow even during very, very difficult times. And there's one person whose good attention we need more than anyone else. It's the person we spend the most time with night and day. Ourselves. Ourselves. So if we are busy grasping th at things or being irritated at other people, pushing things away or spacing out, we're not truly present with ourselves. We've abandoned our hurt. We've abandoned our grief. We've abandoned our loneliness, our fear. We've abandoned ourselves. So that if we want to thrive during difficult times, it is crucial that we learned to be present to ourselves more and more and more. I remember one, uh, one Friday night in my little apartment, I had uh, talked to Erica and Damon, my wife and my son, on the phone. And I thought about going to a movie, but somehow that night it just seemed empty. It just seemed vacuous. Um, I could have called some people in Sacramento, but that wasn't the same as family. So I put some music on, which both uh, soothed and stimulated my loneliness. And then I found myself just pacing around my little apartment, you know, from the living room to the bedroom to the kitchen back to the living room, just pacing faster and faster, feeling more and more frantic, knowing there was nothing I could do to assuage this... Uh, this aching that I was feeling. There was nowhere to run. And then I finally got it. I, there was nowhere I could run, so I just stopped. I remember standing still right there in the middle of my living room, my little living room. And I realized that at that very moment, just as in this moment right now, there are millions of people around the planet feeling just as lonely as I was, maybe more. There are hundreds of millions of people right now grieving the loss of a loved one. There are countless people who are worried about their children, concerned about how they're going to make ends meet, frightened by disease, cowering before violence, and most of them weren't doing anything wrong. Things just don't work out in this life sometimes. Everything we love is going to be taken from us at some point. We all die. We all die. Our society does us an incredible disservice by reassuring us that we are captains of our ship. We are directors of our fate. 
we are in charge of our future. That's bonkers. We have some influence. Yeah, we can influence things. But bad things happen to good people all the time. So standing there in my living room, I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. That's just how life is sometimes. You know, everything breaks. Sometimes things just, I'm not bad for feeling bad. Stuff happens. So I stopped running. And I sat down in a chair in the living room to just feel it. I couldn't run from it. I just sat down to feel it. Just be present. I wasn't trying to talk myself into or out of anything. I was just trying to be present. And you know what? It didn't feel very good. It felt pretty awful. But at least I had myself. At least I had one person in the room, one friend in the room, me. And with that, the loneliness, how can I say this? It began to soften. It didn't go away. It didn't go away. But since I wasn't fighting against it anymore, it was like it began to spread out and soften. And I began to feel poignant, and moist and alive, rather than dry, dusty, and barren. If we want to thrive during difficult times, it is so important to recognize this instinctual response on its own terms. It's not a thought, it's not an idea, it's not a religious creed, it's not a metaphysical principle, it's not a philosophical axiom. It's none of that. It's a wired in, preverbal, preconceptual, biological reflex. A mental, emotional, and sometimes physical tightening. And it focuses all our faculties out there into the world rather than in here. The instinct is very, very simple. And I mean that simple both in the sense that it's not very complicated, and it's also simple in the sense that it's kind of stupid. If there's nothing that we can do to resolve the situation, it doesn't know how to let go. We can lie awake at night in this endless loop of thoughts about our health or our relationship or our situation, go round and round and round. Anybody here ever done that? Anybody here not done that? <laughs> right? It goes round and round, you know, and you just, it, you just don't have to let go of it. It just it doesn't know how to let go of itself. In these cases, I think it's so important to shift our attention from the storyline, from the ideas, from what the situation is, to just notice, just in, in the simplest terms, what's going on inside, just to see the inner holding directly. Because this is magical. Because when we see it fully, it tends to soften. And if it doesn't do that, we can invite it to soften. You, know, you just be with it uh, the same way you would be with a child who wakes up from a nightmare. What do you do? You don't sit there and you don't try to talk the kid out of it. They have the experience. You're just present in a heartful way. And as we do that, some of the swirl of the thoughts and the, and the emotions start to wind down. It's very, very simple, but it's very difficult to do because it goes against this evolutionary reflex to look out there. So when you do it with yourself, it's very important to be kind and gentle and patient, <coughs> to just be there. But as we relax that inner tautness, we don't start thriving overnight, but without the tension, the spinning begins to slow down. It's the tension that drives all that. 
they can just release it. Forget about the stories, just release the tension, and they start to run out of gas. They slow down a little. And with this, there is something deeply mysterious and deeply human that begins to emerge. We begin to notice uh, a poignant, poignant well-being that has nothing to do with fixing anything. We begin to touch or get just a sense of a wholeness that doesn't depend on us controlling anything. Some people will call this well-being God, or the divine, or spirit. Other people will call it human essence, or Buddha nature. I don't care what you call it. I really don't, because it's not an idea. It is a, it's, it's just this wired in, ref it's pre-verbal. It's pre-verbal. All we have to do is just notice this elusive holding on its own terms, and it starts to soften. And this doesn't make us transcend the world out into some other realms, but what it does do is it gives us some of the courage, the patience, the heart, and the intelligence that come more fully back into this life, and to do what we can for ourselves and for our fellow creatures. And as we do that, or actually our sense of self begins to expand and soften a little bit. And we think, you know, maybe I'm not this shrunken peach pit of a self that I thought I was. And the whole sense of self begins to expand out a little bit. And with this, we are truly on a path thriving, even in the most difficult of situations. So before I open up for questions uh, and comments, um, can we just spend a few moments in silence together? So I invite you to close your eyes or let your eyes rest someplace <coughs> undistracting. And let your awareness drift inward. Just see if there's any tightness or tension in there. Tension in your body, edginess in your emotions, holding in your mind. Just see. No judgments, just see. And if you notice any tension, don't try to change anything. If your thoughts are rambling or your attention is wandering, let them ramble and wander. Just notice any tightness and invite it to soften. And if there's no tension, that's, that's great. Just notice the peace, well-being, and spaciousness, and let it radiate naturally from you. Let it flow out. Just notice the, the flux inside, too, how things will rise and then softly pass. Just let it be what it is, relaxing tension and sending out well-being to your fellow human creatures around you.
and all creatures out there in the world. Welcome comments, questions. If you'd just rather stay with the inner space, that's fine too. Yes. Yeah, so um, the rope. Just the rope. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so you talked about um, the um, anxiety without fixation on external thing to explain it. Without? Without the fixation or right. the obsession with something external to explain it, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really interesting idea. I'm curious what, what, what your thoughts are on whether that's just, um, you know, it, is that just an, an, um, an innate part of being a human being? Or is that, uh, you know, because like psychotherapy, for example, would, or psychoanalysis would suggest that there is some underlying cause for that anxiety. Whereas um, other, you know, uh, I, other methods of thought seem to explain it as just sort of an innate uh, element of the human experience. So I'm, I'm wondering what your interpretation of that is. Yeah, the, the Eastern and Western models of where that come from are a little bit different. Um, and I think there's some value in, each, in all of them. Um, I don't think the tension is, is innate to our essence, but that we all collect it you know, from places. Um, the little difference between the Eastern and the Western psychology is that the Western psychology looks more for the, for the causes and history, et cetera, that, that trigger it. Um, the, the Eastern psychology, and I include the meditative disciplines in this, uh, they're more interested in the quality of the mind that is looking at whatever is going on. So to just give you a, a simple model, here's like clear, relaxed, pure, I would call it pure awareness, awareness that doesn't have any agenda. Here's what you see in the world. And that awareness looks through all the attitudes in the mind. So if you are uptight or anxious about something, it can color your perception of everything. And so uh, what you are uptight about may not be what, what you think you're seeing. And so what I'm actually suggesting um, is that where we get the most mileage is by looking at the qualities that are in the mind-heart, regardless of where they came from. Because as, as those can relax a little bit, we can actually see more clearly what's going on. If there's a lot of if there's a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of depression, or something that colors everything that we experience, and we get all caught up in the stories, and yeah, they, they probably do have do have causes and uh, etc. If we had brains that are 17 times the size of ours, we might be able to figure all of that out. But in terms of just practically of how you live day to day, being aware of the quality of the mind. So example, as you're sitting here, you can just feel, does your, does your awareness feel light? Does it feel sleepy? Does it feel tense? Does it feel excited? It's just actually being aware of the quality of the mind um, so that you bring, it's a tricky language here. Traditionally, it's called wholesome qualities, awareness, patience, kindness, compassion, joy, peacefulness, are qualities of mind that have very little tension in them or lead in the direction of less tension. And so as you bring more of those, as you just invite more of those in, then you see more clearly what's going on. And if there's some insights into a particular situation you meet, they will just show up all by themselves. 
But if we become Sherlock Holmes, you know, go in and try to figure things out, when we're trying to figure things out, we are working from our assumptions about, you know, working from what we already understand. Um, Uspinski wrote, um, he said, the chief difficulty he found was that most people keep translating what they hear into their habitual language so that uh, they cease to think they can ever hear anything new. And so as, as you relax all that and see things fresh, there are fresh insights that come up. Does that make sense? Am I getting too esoteric? So um, what you do, what you decide to do about something has a lot of effect just on that particular moment, how you look at it, how you hold it, whether you bring you know, patience and kindness and openness to it or anger and judgment, has a big effect down the road. It's a big effect down the road. So this is really in it for the long run. So, you have, so it's a lot of difficulties recurring in your life. Um, greed wants to solve it and fix it right now. And as you go for that, you just add more tension to it. But if you actually sit back and say, wow, I haven't been this depressed in a long time. You know, far out. You know, you know, it's, it's like just get a little bit of space around it, bring a little kindness and patience to it. That actually opens the mind and heart up more so we can see more clearly. When we can see more clearly, we become wiser. When I have a lot of tension, we get stupider. So it's just the way. Um, wisdom is perception. That's all it is. Cleverness is figuring things out, but a wise person is one that can just see to the heart of a situation or see the heart of a person. So we're actually trying to cultivate wisdom by you know, allowing the mind to be softer and more open. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, can you provide some tips on how to break out of those habits we often get stuck in using things like, for me, I think it's just keeping myself incessantly busy, whether it's in work or personal life. And I think partly that's maybe avoiding or not figuring out how to deal with what it is that's going on. And even when I try and meditate, um, it's fighting the noise in my head and not being able to quite break past it. Um, I'm sure there's no easy solution to it, but any new insights or thoughts would be appreciated on how to make the change. Um, there are lots and lots of techniques, but let, let me uh, to just say a, a couple simple general things. Is that in meditation, this is a mistake people make. In meditation, our job is not to fix anything. It's not to get rid of anything. Um, here is an esoteric secret that ought to be obvious to everyone. If you have an unwholesome quality, let's say anger or aversion or fear, and you have wholesome qualities, you know, like peace, uh, awareness, mindfulness, in the mind at the same time, which one wins? The wholesome always wins. We get very cynical about it. but. I mean, you can, f you, you can feel it. So if, if you're feeling some tension, and then if you can just step back and see it clearly, oh, look at that tension. It has a, has a subtle tendency to relax a little bit. So, so what that means when you meditate is rather than trying to get rid of all those rambling thoughts, is to just let them run but just relax any tension that you feel within them. And then what happens is those thoughts will gradually run out of gas. It's the tension that fuels them. If you relax around it and it's got a full tank of gas, it'll keep going for a while, but you're not putting more gas in the tank, so it will gradually run out. If you try to stop, then it's like me, as I was talking before about my cat Bailey, when he was hissing, you know, it's like slapping it for him. You know, that's that's not going to calm him at all. But if I scratch him and get him purring and allow him, it's okay. You know, then it opens up. So um, I th I think it's really important to bring a lot of heart, a lot of patience, 
uh, and to cut ourselves a lot of slack. My, um, my little organization, um, I had to put together a, a nonprofit because people were giving me money that I was giving to other people, so I need to keep all transparent. And so but I call it easing awake, easing awake, that uh, you know, the key to awakening is actually cultivating a certain amount of ease. Because when the mind is relaxed, it is very sensitive. You this little flicker over there, you see it. You know, when you're like this, then a train runs over and you hardly notice it. Um, it also, the difficulty with this in the beginning is that there's no reason for you to trust that this is actually going to work. I mean, you can take my word for it, but that's just my, I mean, who am I? But you have to try it enough, and then as you begin to feel it working, then that, you know, then th actually it's faith, it's confidence builds up that, okay, that the peace and the well-being we're, we're looking for is actually here all the time. I, I'll give you my little image of it. Um, you have a classroom filled with kids, and they're throwing knives and books and yelling and playing boom boxes and all that stuff. And over there in the corner, um, there's a kid who's writing poetry. And you wouldn't know it because of all the hubbub. But then you come in class very early, and the kid is the only one there. And so you go over and you sit down next to her. Maybe you talk a little bit, or maybe you just kind of sit together. And then as the other kids come in, they rattle the chairs and create all this noise and all that, all that stuff is there. So everything comes back. But now you know what that's like over there. And even in the hubbub, you can actually feel that over there. And that's when you start to get a little confidence. And then rather than fight all the hubbub, you just sort of relax into that peaceful place and then allow whatever insight to come out. So that's a that's that's a quick answer. So, um, in order to maintain the relaxed mind mm -hmm. in in your day to day life, like for example, like when you're in the grocery store or something like that, um, how do you respond to tension that you come across? <coughs> Um, the most important thing is to see it, uh, to take the broader frame of your question. I think it's really helpful to have some type of spiritual practice. So I meditate every morning. And part, and part of that is, quite frankly, what it is, is it's putting myself in a quiet room without any of those other distractions where it's just easier to actually feel the kid writing poetry. So, uh, so I become more familiar with that. And then as that gets stronger, it begins to uh, carry out in the world. Um, we also have uh, a process um, that's the most effective one I've ever found that uh, we affectionately call it six R's. Is when you get distracted or something pulls you away, you recognize what it is. OK, I'm pulled away. The mind is jumpy, et cetera, et cetera. And then you release it. And release it just means you let it be what it is. <coughs> Suzuki Roshi, a uh, Zen uh, teacher, said uh, the best way to control a cow was to put it in a very large pasture. <laughs> so you just give it a lot of space, recognize release, then you relax any tension that you feel. And as that tension goes out, there'll be a little bit of space in the mind, and all the old habits will actually pour back into that. So it's recognize, release, relax. And then you want to bring some uplifted qualities in there. And the easiest way to do this is just smile, just a little bit. Like if you do it now, you can feel what happens. What we know from the way the brain operates is when you smile a little bit, it tends to lighten things. Recognize, release, relax, smile, and then you go back back to engage. And so the people that are doing meditation training with me, they just got a lot, a lot of experience with that. And so what happens is that becomes a wired in habit. So that when something comes up, rather than just go <laughs> strangle, 
Oh, okay, there it is. Let it be. And so you, you just kind of get a foot in the door. Um, I, I, I'm a great believer in, um, in developing some spiritual practice. It's sort of like going to the gym. You know, you work out, you strengthen muscles. And the point is not to become good at doing push-ups, but it's the point is to strengthen your body, or the stronger body. It's the same thing with a meditation practice, is to give yourself a break. <laughs> You know, set up some time periods in which you can actually practice that a little bit. Um, and even if it's nothing else than just sitting for a few minutes, that's sort of what I did at the end. Is that, that little meditation, just notice what comes up. The most important thing is the relaxing the tension. And so you get some practice at that. Uh, it's unreasonable to expect that you'll be able to do something that subtle, you know, in the midst of crisis at work. But as you practice more, it does, be, it does become a little bit habitual. So what do you do when you're caught up already? So you're already in deep tension mm -hmm. or stress. And how do you? OK. Um, that's a great question. So um, one thing you can do is work real hard to get rid of the tension. And that will just increase it. Right? So uh, you know, our, our job actually is not to solve the tension. Uh, the, just imagine that maybe it's not actually a problem. That if you can cultivate some wholesome qualities. So awareness is a very, very wholesome, very powerful thing. So if you can just be a little more aware that uh, things are really tense, that will tend to drain it out. The, the difficulty is, is that there's this in-between stage. Some people call it the dark night of the soul. Uh, I call them Alfred Hitchcock moments, where there's enough awareness that you know when you're caught up and angry at somebody and you just you want to throttle them, you have enough clarity, you have enough awareness inside that says, "Wow, you know, I just really uh, I've lost it here," but the awareness is not quite strong enough to know what to do about it, and so that's the point we try to clamp down on it. But actually, frankly, to Grab for peacefulness is just a form of greed or aversion. Maybe it's aversion, you want to get rid of something, but it's, and so that doesn't help. But what you want to do is to create, uh, is to bring in more of those wholesome qualities. And I would say those six R's um, is, a, is a really effective way to do that because they're all, because it's kind of mechanical. Uh, so that you just start bringing a little more awareness just knowing that particularly if it's a deep pattern, it's not going to disappear overnight. But you kind of get a toe in the door. And then uh, after you've been able to do it a few times, then you get a little bit of confidence that maybe, maybe this maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. So as you're walking, how do you think, ah, I wish I'd asked that. <laughs> this is your chance. <laughs> hey, at some level. Uh, on some level, I mean, that, uh, that's a great question. It's, it's actually a pretty profound one. Um, Let me throw a curve at you. That's, that's a great question. So imagine this. Every day in your life, you walk into a room, take your clothes off, and they take a picture of you in a certain posture. And you live 100 years. And you take all those frames and you put them together into a movie that runs for, I might say, 15 minutes. Okay? 
And then, just to make it more fun, we start the movie a year before you're born and run it, say, five years after your death. So we're watching this, this film. And so at first, there's nothing. Right? And then there's your mother. She starts to swell up. Pop, out you come, and you're nursing and peeing and pooping and not doing too much. You know, you go through all that stuff with your body. You know, it starts to stretch out a little bit. Maybe a little bit of baby fat goes down a little bit. And there you are standing up. And maybe, you know, five minutes in the film, you know, you're coming into, uh, you know, adolescence. And there's the sort of vitality of youth and young adults. And um, body gets stronger. And then, after, and then there's a sort of plateau. And then you know, the body sort of droops a little bit. And maybe the eyes are sparkly, but the skin is a little blotchy. And the hair starts to gray a little bit. And it stoops a little bit more. And then some of the light goes out of the eyes. And then there's this. And then 13, 14 minutes in the film, there's just this body on the floor. And the film goes on. And so the skin dries up, disappears gone. There's just a skeleton. And then gradually, it starts to crumble, turn to dust, blows away, and it's gone. So where are you in all this? So this it begins to sound a little esoteric, but if you just picture that, at any moment in time, you're obviously here. You're holding a microphone, and you know, and, and I'm here. We're talking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on this larger span of time, so Buddhism is famous for what they say is 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 that there is nothing essential in us that separates us from everything else. We are just a process. And what happens, and this is evolutionary too, is we latch onto and identify with you know, what I feel right now. And if our happiness, if, if you know, a source of well-being is keeping you just like you are right now, forever, you know, you're cooked. <laughs> you know, it won't happen. If I remember the first time that a close friend of mine died. I was a uh, sophomore or junior year in, in high school, and uh, Larry was killed in a car accident. And, uh, and that was pretty weird, uh, you know, just to actually be with all that. The strangest thing about it all was that the next week, we had our French midterm exam right on schedule. And I remember sitting in that French midterm taking this, because Larry used to sit up there. And I say, has anybody noticed? You know, Larry is gone. What are we doing? You know, it's like, ah. I wanted to write on the exam, Laurent say more. <laughs> it's like, has anybody noticed the guy's gone? And I got it. You know, that when I die, there will be, you know, a handful of people that will mourn me for a few years. But even they will get up the next morning and complain about politics and, you know, and everything else that life will go on without me. And so a lot of the base tension that we have is trying to hold on to a, a kind of an eternal existence that just isn't, it just isn't there. And so if, if you can imagine sort of really getting it, that in not too many years, I'm going to be gone. And you know, 100 years from now, I don't know if there's any sign I was ever on the planet. And and you can feel how hard it is to hold that thought. But if you can be with that a little bit, there's like something that relaxes. It's like, OK, you know, this is, you know, we're part of this. We're just part of an ongoing process. And it's really OK. And as you can tap into that a little bit, there really is a deep kind of well-being that is behind all of it. It's not mine. It's not yours but we're just there with it. But if we want to hold on to our job, our body, anything like that, it's a disaster. I, I remember, <laughs> oh my goodness. 
first time I learned where babies came from. You know, I was probably about, I don't know, five when my mother told me the story. You know, the sperm and the egg and the sex act, the whole thing. And I think I had a pretty typical five-year-old response to it. It was like, oh, you're kidding. That's gross. <laughs> but, I, but I remember that night lying in bed looking at the ceiling and thinking, so what if my mother and father had not gone to the University of Michigan at the same time? What if they had not ever fallen in love? What if they hadn't been in the mood to start a baby at a particular afternoon in 1947 or whatever, whenever it was? You know, What if a different one of those five million sperm, whatever it is, hit the egg? I could just think of a zillion con contingencies in which I would not exist. And nobody would notice. They wouldn't even miss me. They probably have another second child and give them my name. You know, <laughs> you know that, our, that our existence here is such a fluke. You know, and, and, uh, and if, if we really get that, it's actually, at first it's kind of scary, but when we really get it, it's actually quite joyful. You know, because you know, every moment's a gift. And that can be wonderful in the next moment. Because if I can go back to the prehistoric scene, walking through the jungle, there was one guy who was at one with everything. The trees, the lakes, the saber-toothed kitties, the big bears, it's all lovely. And there's another guy who's frightened of everything, you know, and it'll rustle and he runs around like a paranoid squirrel and <laughs> Guess whose DNA we, were, we got, you know? I look at the squirrels running out there, you know? It's like, whoa, they are like so uptight. But if they relaxed a little bit, they'd get eaten by the next dog that came along. So that's been bred into us. But it's not metaphysical. You know, it's not how reality is. It's just an artifact of, uh, of evolutionary processes. Wow, I didn't expect you to be here. Anything more, or have you had enough? So uh, let me close um, with my favorite poem of all time. It kind of touches on uh, some of the things you've been talking about. which is um, peacefulness, equanimity, and where you find it. This poem about equanimity is written by Donald C. Babcock. Now we're ready to look at something pretty special. It is a duck riding the ocean 100 feet beyond the surf. No, it isn't a gull. A gull always has a raucous touch about him. This is some sort of duck, and he cuddles in the swells. He isn't cold, and he is thinking things over. There's a big heaving in the Atlantic, and he is a part of it. He looks a bit like the, a mandarin, where the Lord Buddha meditating under the bow tree, but he has hardly enough above the eyes to be a philosopher. He has poise, however which is what philosophers must have. He can rest while the Atlantic heaves because he rests in the Atlantic. Probably he doesn't know how large the ocean is, and neither do you, but he realizes it. And what does he do, I ask you? He sits down in it. He reposes in the immediate as if it were infinity, which it is. That is religion, and the duck has it. He has made himself part of the boundless by easing himself into it just where it touches him. I like the little duck. He doesn't know much, but he has religion. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for your questions and your good attention. 
and um, may we all learn how to sit on sit down on the waves. You know, as long far back as we can see into history, there have been waves. Where they will always be there. The art is learning how to sit down in them, to rest in them. That's where the true peace comes from. Namaste. Thank you.